Do you remember way back in 2017 when everyone was obsessed with the alt-right? In the wake of Gamergate and at the dawn of the Trump presidency, we had identified this new political niche, this radical and sometimes dangerous movement that was gaining a lot of traction and somehow attracting swaths of young, mostly white men. And we spent years talking about it, dissecting it, figuring out who was leading the helm and what kind of rhetorical tactics they were using. We even had a fun little name for it. We called it the Alt-Right Pipeline. But then stuff happened. There was a whole pandemic and an attempted coup, uh, and Australia was on fire for a while. Do you remember that? And as the world was burning, discussions of the alt-right and the pipeline that had created them were put aside. We had bigger fish to fry. Now, don't get me wrong, people are still talking about alt-right figures and radical rhetoric. But it feels different now, right? Like, we're still talking about it, but we've stopped asking questions about it. We think we have it all figured out. We know there's an alt-right pipeline, and we know where it's coming from, and we know how they attract people. Or so we think. Because, as it turns out, while we have been busy with, you know... The alt-right pipeline has changed. So, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the alt-right and the new alt-right pipeline. And let's talk about the channel that's not just helped the pipeline stay open, but has even added shiny new entrances with sleek matte branding stamped on the side. Let's talk about PragerU. Alright, so for those of you who may not be familiar, PragerU is a YouTube channel and conservative nonprofit whose goal is to funnel casual viewers toward their core right wing messaging. And that's not an inference on my part either. I'm not putting words in their mouth or anything, they literally advertise it. But we have an important question to ask here How does PragerU funnel their viewers, and what makes their funnel different from the traditional alt right pipeline? Well, according to their marketing materials, their funnel looks like this. The mouth of the funnel opens with two types of videos, short educational videos and skits. They make five-minute videos that are meant to look like clear, trustworthy educational resources about current events for people who might want to learn more about stuff going on in the news. And then they also make funny little TikToks and quick man-on-the-street clips for people looking for laughs. Both kinds of videos usually feature caricatures of leftists, or the most damning sound bites they could get from left-leaning people. And they're basically saying, hey, look how wild these opinions are! Aren't you glad you're not as radical as these crazy leftists? Which functions to make their educational content look moderate, or to make the left-leaning positions look absurd and funny. Once you've seen a couple of these videos, you might think, you know what? These are pretty funny or useful. I want to keep watching. And so you subscribe to their channel. Once they have your subscription, their content shows up on your YouTube home feed. And now you're not just getting their basic, broadly appealing content, but you're also getting their podcasts and their mini documentaries and their interviews with conservative figures. And maybe in one of their videos, they mention how YouTube is censoring their content, and that really piques your interest. What could they have said that was so bad that it got removed from the platform? So maybe you think, you know what, let me check out their website and see if I can find their censored content there. So you go to their website, and you start watching their restricted videos playlist, and once you've spent a couple hours there, maybe you sit back and think, you know what, this is really solid, I can't believe that they're being unfairly censored by YouTube, how can I show my support? And so, you browse the site and find a big donation link that tells you how, for only $35 a month, you can become a member of Prager United and get quarterly gift boxes and discounts for their merch store, because of course they have a merch store, and other perks and insider updates. And suddenly, you've become a paying member of the PragerU family. Now, this sounds pretty similar to the traditional alt-right pipeline, right? In the mid-2010s, disinformation and bigotry reached a fever pitch on YouTube. 
This was the age of angry, reactionary content creators who were anti-feminist, anti-SJW, and anti-PC. But these creators didn't pull viewers in by immediately inundating them with racist rhetoric or explicit calls to violence. They pulled them in using silly comedy videos and web comics and movie reviews and gaming videos. Those were the videos that had mass appeal, and once you'd watched a video about how silly Aeneas Sarkeesian is, maybe you got a video about forced diversity in video games, and then you got one about immigration and white replacement theory. This is the exact same trajectory as PragerU's content funnel. So what makes this new pipeline different from the old one? Well, the old pipeline was built on several different channels all working together to bring people in. But the thing about PragerU is that it's more like a traditional media company or TV network. They keep everything in-house. They have a monopoly on the pipeline. It's pretty much just them. And that's dangerous. PragerU features all these different right-wing creators and academics and speakers and just, like, normal people under the same banner with the same sleek editing and consistent branding. They advertise these speakers as experts and label themselves as a university, if not a legit educational institution, then at least, like, an alternative kind of school that has a budget and is really polished and put together. This consistent branding helps to make all of their speakers appear equivalent. PragerU features people from all across the spectrum of right-wing thought, and when they come together under the same banner, it makes them all look pretty moderate. When you have one video featuring former White House Press Secretary Dana Perino, where she gives you advice on how to get through a quarter-life crisis, and then you have another video from noted political agitator and conspiracy theorist Charlie Kirk, where he explains how colleges and universities are leftist cults and indoctrination centers, they're put on the same playing field, so they must be peers, right? A legit educational institution wouldn't platform total radicals, right? I mean, they talk to former White House press secretaries and CEOs and writers and politicians. By putting people like Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens and Steven Crowder next to actual politicians and moderate establishment Republicans, it makes those more radical voices seem less radical. In other words, Prager use universal design language, the consistency of their presentation and branding across videos regardless of presenter, reinforces the notion that all of Prager use content is equally legitimate. In this way, more radical figures like Dennis Prager and Candace Owens, along with Ben Shapiro and Dave Rubin, are cast as equal participating members of the same institution as Ginny Thomas and Dana Perino. PragerU inculcates a chain of equivalence between the neoliberalism of Reagan, the neoconservatism of George W. Bush, the Tea Party, Trumpism, and key figures of the alt-right. This also obfuscates the distinction between PragerU's mainstream presenters and their radical counterparts, essentially allowing viewers to sleepwalk from established orthodox conservatism into radicalism without realizing it. PragerU's style also makes all these figures appear more qualified. You know how people used to make all those, like, fake Abraham Lincoln quotes and put them in those really, like, official-looking meme formats with the big black box where the text is, like, next to the portrait? And then everyone on Facebook was like, oh yeah, that looks real, that's totally legit, that was definitely an Abraham Lincoln quote. That is what PragerU is doing. Their channel and website are really polished with nice matte colors and consistent branding. Most people know that Prager University isn't a real university, but they really do advertise themselves as an alternative educational institution. They're put together, and when they create content that looks like something a real university would make, their videos are a lot easier to swallow. PragerU unites the American right, from Reaganist orthodoxy to the alt-right. These ideas are presented using the same branding and are thus portrayed as equally legitimate, sharing in Prager's university status and slick presentation style. PragerU treats all its presenters as equal representatives of one institution. Basically, their content looks like something you'd see from Khan Academy or in a TED Talk, and that makes you trust them the same way you'd trust something that you heard from Khan Academy or in a TED Talk. It's just that with PragerU, the people that you're listening to aren't experts in their field or qualified scholars. 
They're news pundits and conspiracy theorists and discredited academics. So we have these radical right-wing presenters who are featured next to establishment Republicans, which makes them seem less radical. They're on the same field as these others, so they can't be that bad, right? And then these presenters are given the same polish. Their radical beliefs are presented in official sleek infographics. White supremacists don't use infographics. These people are taken seriously by institutions that make cute little animations for them. No one with cute little animations could really be that bad, right? Well, <laughs> they are bad. They're just paying their graphic designers to make them look good. But that brings us to our next question. How did they get all this money for graphic designers anyway? PragerU has a budget of tens of millions of dollars. A lot of this money comes from individual donations and from the conservative donor network. But a lot of their money also comes from YouTube. To understand how they took over right-wing YouTube, we first need to understand the algorithm. So the algorithm is built on connections. It's all about finding videos that connect to each other and all about, well, if you like this, then you'll probably like this other thing too. For an example of this, think of the Paul brothers. On their own, they may not have done as well, but because they made similar content and made it really obvious to the algorithm that they were connected, they were able to bounce off of each other and both able to sort of skyrocket to fame. This tactic was also used by the members of the original alt-right pipeline. Like this chart shows, all of these various right-wing creators featured each other in their videos. They did collaborations, they went on each other's podcasts, they built each other up. And this is exactly what PragerU is doing. Sort of. <laughs> See, PragerU isn't shouting out right-wing creators or telling you to subscribe to the Joe Rogan podcast. What PragerU is doing is bringing all of these creators in-house. And because PragerU has all these different videos about different issues featuring different speakers from different parts of the right, their videos are recommending more of their own videos. It's all internal. Instead of helping other channels grow, it's all feeding back into itself. So let's take a step back and take stock. PragerU is doing the same stuff that the first alt-right pipeline was doing, but doing it all themselves, doing it with a more widely cast net, doing it in a polished faux academic style, and exclusively reaping all of the rewards both algorithmically and monetarily. In other words, PragerU replicates the alt-right pipeline, but on a much larger scale. It broadens the network to include a much wider swath of the American right, and by placing the entire spectrum of right-wing politics under one roof with identical branding, it inculcates a sense of equivalence. In short, PragerU increases access to the alt-right and simultaneously mainstreams, legitimizes, and funds it. PragerU extends the radicalization pipeline to include the mainstream right, and then seeks to extend it further still, exposing more and more viewers to alt-right thinkers and priming them for even more radical positions. This is, in essence, the clear and present danger that PragerU poses. So, what do we do about this? Like, <laughs> they're obviously bad and just getting worse as they grow, so we need to find a way to stop them, right? Well, one of the things we can do is what I'm doing. Response videos are good at raising awareness and making fun of some of the more absurd claims that PragerU makes, but they're also not necessarily serious takedowns of serious issues. So one of the other things that we can do as creators is to use some of the tactics that they use, but in our own stuff. They have found this great way to help themselves grow and to take over the algorithm. They know how to manipulate those connections that YouTube looks for when figuring out what to recommend to people. Now, I know that we can't all feature each other in all of our videos, but making more connections and doing more collaborations can only help. Something else that is severely lacking, though, is scholarly research. I want you to guess how many scholarly papers mention PragerU. Not just, like, about the concept of the alt-right pipeline, and not even solely about PragerU, just that mention PragerU. Guess. A hundred? A thousand? More? Put it in the comments. Well, <laughs> the answer is five. I can count the number of scholarly papers that mention PragerU on one hand. And two of those papers aren't even published yet. 
I actually had the opportunity to meet with a few researchers who are really diving into PragerU, and I used two of their soon-to-be-published papers for this video. One of their papers is forthcoming in the journal Patterns of Prejudice, and the other is forthcoming in Identities, but is still in the review process because academic publishing is a whole thing right now, so big shout out to Rob and Tom at the University of Sussex. Thank you folks so much for doing this work, it is incredible and really helpful. But even with these papers, there is still a massive gap in the research here. And this has some pretty dire implications. Like, if no one questions PragerU, then are they just free to do whatever they want? If no one is keeping tabs on them and measuring the impact they have, then how will we ever really know what kinds of effects their massive media empire has? This research gap is a huge issue and definitely needs to be addressed. So if you're a social scientist or a graduate student who studies this kind of thing, then consider diving into the world of PragerU and the effects that they have on the new right. Because until we have a handle on who they are and what they're doing, we won't be able to combat their misleading and dangerous misinformation. And if you are interested in doing scholarly research in this area and you want to reach out to the authors of the papers that I've cited here, I have been given full permission to post an email address in the description, so feel free to get in touch with them. And thanks again to Rob and Tom for sharing their work and being a part of this project. It would not have been possible without you two. The last suggestion I have for how to move forward is to support the folks who are actively working toward changing education. Not just providing a counter to PragerU, but actually trying to change the foundations of how we think about education. And that's where the Human Restoration Project comes in. The Human Restoration Project is a nonprofit that aims to illuminate, foster, and challenge traditional and progressive educational practices by bringing the humanity back into education. They have a conference coming up, and they've actually sponsored today's video so that I can spread the word about the event, because I know my audience, I know that y'all are a bunch of nerds, and most of you are interested in how we can make systemic change and fix, you know. So the Conference to Restore Humanity is an all-virtual international conference open to educators at any level, and it's happening from July 25th to the 28th. The folks at HRP believe that an academic conference that's accessible, sustainable, and representative is way overdue. So the Conference to Restore Humanity is their way of combating that, because it's been purposefully designed around accessibility and sustainability of virtual learning. This basically translates to more Q&As with the presenters and more engagement both during and after the conference. The content covered during the conference includes restorative justice, anti-racism, anti-carceral education, childism, neurodivergence in schools, and going gradeless, which y'all know that I'm definitely here for. <laughs> so if you are an educator interested in learning about and discussing these topics with other educators, then this is the academic conference for you. If this sounds like something you want to get in on, then go to humanrestorationproject.org slash conference, which I have linked in the description, and use promo code ZOEB to get $25 off your ticket price. I'll be getting a little kickback if you use this code when you check out, so not only will you be getting a discount, but you will also be helping to support the channel. Again, that's humanrestorationproject.org slash conference using promo code ZOEB. And if you want to learn more about the awesome folks over at the Human Restoration Project, then you can follow them on Twitter at at HumeResPro. And I also have a lot of their resources from their site linked in the description if you want to dive deeper into human-centered education. Anyway, thanks again to the folks at the Human Restoration Project for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys so, so much. <laughs> What this all comes down to, though, is that there is no one solution. We can't just do response videos, or just mimic their tactics, or just publish research, or just do conferences. PragerU is uniting the right, and if we want to have any chance of beating them at their own game, we need to unite too. If we want to understand the political shifts that have been happening in earnest since 2016, if we want to understand the rise in violence against women and LGBTQ people and people of color, if we want to understand and avoid these things, we cannot afford to overlook PragerU's role in far-right discourse. This pipeline still exists, and that's a problem. But it's a problem that we can fix together. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. I have lots more videos coming this summer. Like, I have like nine videos planned for the next couple months. So 
be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you can stay notified when those videos are posted. This video would not have been possible without the support from my wonderful patrons over on Patreon, as well as my channel members here on YouTube, and I want to give a special shout out to A Tasty Snack, Adam, Al Swigert, Andrew, Dylan, Justin Lowry, Robert Bradford, Science Punk Sellout, and Will Swanson. Thank you all so very, very much. And if you want to join all of these wonderful folks whose names are scrolling here beside me, then check out the links in the description to see how you can get early access to videos, join our patron-only Discord server, or have a custom poem written just for you. Speaking of, today's poem patron is Ash Wetzel, and for you, Ash, here is On the potato that sprouted from the pile of rot under the kitchen window where we threw our food scraps. We started doing it after the chickens died throwing all the potato peels and banana peels and corn husks out the window. We expected them to break down into nothing, to melt into the dead grass and return to whence they came. We found the first sprout the next spring. It was potatoes. It was clumps of green among the brown and speckles. It was almost basil leaves hiding potatoes. Potato. Just one potato. We pulled it up and brought it in washed off the soil and what else. We questioned if it was safe to eat. Was its rotten earth somehow part of it now? If I bit into its too white flesh, would it be soft and grainy? Would it squish between my lips, give way under my teeth, melt into the sour sludge that oozes out from under the pile of refuse where it grew? If something is born from garbage, is it itself garbage? Does where you plant your roots decide what makes its way into your veins? We fried it up, our garbage-born potato, with homegrown ramps and our good olive oil, and threw its skin out the window to be reborn again and again. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks.